Buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches, bienvenido, bonjour, buen après-midi, bonne nuit, bienvenue, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, depending on which part of the world you might be tuning in from. Welcome to day three of RP21 under the theme, Building Resilient Economies in the Americas and the Caribbean. The last two days have been insightful and informative, and we can expect to see that today as well as tomorrow, which is the final day. I am Dr. Terry Carrell Reed, pleased to serve you as host over the next or over the four days. We're coming to you live from the Jamaica Conference Center in Kingston, Jamaica, where we're right in front of the waterfront, the Kingston Harbor, which is the seventh largest natural harbor in the world. We wish you could have been here with us, but we are glad to have you online as well. Those of you who are viewing on the Hopping platform, the RP21 webpage, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, wherever it is you're watching, we thank you so very much for your viewership as well as your participation. So let's get started started with Parallel Session 6. The title, Local Governments, Environmental Management and Disaster Risk Reduction, Addressing Multiple Hazards and Supporting the Most at Risk. The organizers are Government of Jamaica, the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, or CDEMA, the National Unit for Disaster Risk Management, Colombia, Pan American Health Organization, PAHO, and the UN Environment. The esteemed moderator for this parallel session is Yuri Shakalal, Senior Specialist, Natural Disaster and Risk Management, Inter-American Development Bank. Please welcome him and our panelists. Welcome and good day distinguished dignitaries and delegates. On behalf of the government of Jamaica, as the chair of the seventh regional platform for disaster risk reduction in the Americas, co-organized together with the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction and the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, CEDIMA, I relay a wagwan and a warm virtual Caribbean welcome to all participants wherever you might be located. I have the distinct pleasure of being the virtual general session moderator for this parallel session six, focused on the topic, local government, environmental management and disaster risk reduction, addressing multiple hazards and supporting the most at risk. Our session has a wide scope of content and is quite compressed. And as such, before I outline in summary, the objectives, relevance and structure of the session, I remind and ask that key presenters and panelists honor as best they can their allotted times in order that we can cover the ground expected efficiently. I believe you would agree with me that the true front lines of where most of natural hazard climate change and more recently COVID-19 global pandemic impacts is significantly felt is on the ground at community and local levels, often by the most socially and economically vulnerable populations. Here is where the rubber really meets the road. Specifically, with respect to objectives, the core of this session seeks to, one, explore just how the convergence and manifestation of multiple environmental, climate-related, and biological hazards, example, coronavirus-induced health impacts, are being situationally and contextually managed using a multi-sectoral approach at national and local levels. What are the challenges and what can we learn for future pandemics and other disasters? Another objective is to identify common actors and best practices for the advancement of the Sendai Disaster Risk Reduction Priorities 1 and 2. That is, understanding disaster risk and strengthening disaster risk governance to manage disaster risk. The idea here really is to identify best practices that can be shared, adapted, and replicated by countries within the region or even at a regional level. A third objective is really for us to promote the exchange of experiences between different countries and regions that have successfully integrated disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation into local government and the management of environmental systems. From the narrow perspective of purely personal observation, we are either A, 
conditioned or more capable to better prepare, respond, cope and manage, or some may argue correspondingly, desensitized to be underprepared based on the frequency of hazards we most often experience. Some may argue that while intersectoral governance structures attain and exist within the conceptual design of our respective national DRM frameworks, that their optimization in actual operational practice or functional practice at local levels can be quite challenged. I believe that we have to better recognize this and seek to rapidly change our operational performance. It mirrors our existential choice at the global level, climate change. We either adapt or perish. Over the past two years, the world has witnessed just how COVID-19, often exacerbated by the concurrence of climate-related extreme events, natural and man-made hazards, had led to devastating economic direct and indirect impacts on health, social, and economic and financial systems, including accompanying social unrest while cascading across sectors and countries, either triggering or threatening partial or total system failures. In terms of relevance, fundamentally, uh, the session is seeking to advance our understanding of how coherently best at a local governance level to address multiple cascading hazards that are capable of precipitating systemic failure risk for the most vulnerable. In terms of structure of the session, in summary, we have a feature address by our key presenter, Honorable Homer Edward Davis, Minister of State in the Ministry of Local Government, Rural Development. We have a short video sharing some recent regional experiences. We have a round table moderated by Mr. Robert Hill, CEO of the Kingston and St. Andrew Corporation. And we have, uh, which features uh, panelists, mayors from Colombia, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica itself, along with parish level disaster coordinators for municipal corporations. I'd like to mention that we also have um, running, and I encourage you to, to log in. Um, uh, those of you in, the, in, in, in Jamaica uh, may see a QR code, and those of you online may see an access button to the survey um, within within your, your interface right now. And I'd encourage you to, to actually uh, complete the survey because we'll come to the, at the end of the session, we'll come to try and look at the responses to those questions. Um, but before I go on, and before I invite the Honorable Edward Davis, Minister of State to deliver the feature address, a few words of short introduction of the minister. Minister Davis is an experienced politician who is consistently agitating for the development of his constituents and wider Jamaica. He is the member of parliament representing the constituency of St. James Southern. Amongst his many achievements, the Honorable Minister has previously served as councillor for the Cambridge Division, the 17th mayor of the city of Montego Bay and the chairman of the St. James Municipal Corporation. He has also functioned as the director of the Montego Bay Chamber of Commerce and Industry from 2000 to 2006. He is also a Justice of the Peace, and he was also awarded the Order of Distinction in the rank of commander in, on October 2018 for his dedicated public service in the field of local government. The minister places a high value on education and community development and wholeheartedly embraces the spirit of partnership and openness for investment to achieve the vision of shared prosperity for Jamaica. Without further ado, I invite the Honorable Minister to deliver the feature address. Minister. Good morning to our viewers. Good morning to our listeners. Today is indeed a great day for Jamaica. Yuri Chakahal, Senior Specialist, National Disaster Risk Management, Inter-American Development Bank. Mr. Robert Hill, Chief Executive Officer, Kinson and St. Andrew Municipal Corporation. Mr. Delroy Williams, Senator, Councillor, 
Mayor of Kingston and St. Andrew Corporation, Elena Coombs, Parish Disaster Coordinator, Clarendon Municipal Corporation. I will now give the keynote address. The slowness and complicity of bureaucracy have for many years been identified as key reasons why governments fail to consistently deliver timely policy outcomes for their citizens. This takes on a particular meaning when the pressure of leading vulnerable societies located in our geographic regions are taken into account. There is no question that in the Americas and the Caribbean, we go up and slide down a slippery economic ladder. And this is significantly attributable to the constant assault of climate change on our physical space and on our population. We live year by year, hoping that our national and regional efforts to create sustainable mechanism for achieving disaster risk reduction will not be swept away by Mother Nature. When it comes to the effects of disaster, the Regional Assessment Report on Disaster Risk in Latin America and the Caribbean 2021 provides some sobering statistics. It states that one out of every four disasters registered in the world occurred in this region. 277 million people in Latin America and the Caribbean have been directly or indirectly affected by disaster events. 53% of global economic losses due to climate-related disaster were produced in Latin America and the Caribbean. These challenges have been amplified by the severe impact of COVID-19, which has been with us for the last 18 months. This region accounts for more than 20% of the world's cases and 30% of global fatalities. This was a significant factor in the edge of 8% economic contraction that the region experienced in 2020. And it is ampering the economic recovery efforts being made this year. Governments are constantly challenged to simultaneously respond to crisis immediately while planning for the crisis to come. These pressures are intensified by evolving attitudes and expectations about the role of government from our electorate and the wider population. In this pressure cooker environment, it is perhaps unsurprising that policy misalignment exists. However, it is also true that a lack of policy coherence is not inevitable. It is not doomed to happen. Ultimately, it is an outcome of leadership at the political and administrative levels, both national and municipal. The government of Jamaica has been deliberate in creating a governance structure that seeks to connect policies for which a range of ministries is responsible and strongly promote partnership between ministers and their ministries. The expression we use for this is joined up government. In addition, this government, since it came to office in 2016, has featured a unique ministry, the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation. This ministry falls under the supervision of the Prime Minister of Jamaica and includes among its policy responsibilities 
planning, land, environment, and climate change, water, and public works. This reflects our position that the protection and promotion of the environment and the implementation of climate smart technologies in public infrastructure are part of the push for high and sustained level of economic growth and economic development. It also reflects the government's view that economic expansion, environmental protection, and other elements of disaster risk reduction are not in conflict with each other and must be pursued together. This super ministry therefore brings all the elements of the planning, regulatory, and implementation processes together in order to streamline development process. The decision to treat disaster risk reduction as a high priority component of the strategy to achieve economic growth has been shaped over decades by special vulnerabilities that Jamaica has, has a small island developing state. The frequency and intensity of natural disaster have for a long time retarded our ability to implement initiatives to generate any sustained recovery from their occurrence. As a small island developing state, Jamaica's coastline is approximately 886 kilometers long and is home to a high percentage of our living ecosystem. The coastline also features most of our critical infrastructure, formal and informal housing, and a wide range of economic activities, including tourism, farming, fishing, shipping, and mining. Indeed, almost all our parish capitals, along with our two cities, Kingston and Montego Bay, touch the sea, and over 70% of our population resides in coastal areas. Improving the management of our coastal zones is therefore critical importance for the preservation of the environment, including marine life, as well as for the protection of our tourism, agriculture, fisheries, forestry, and water resources, all of which are climate sensitive. It is for these reasons that the government has initiated coastline protection projects, such as the Montego Bay Waterfront Project Protection Project, which seeks to reduce the loss of beachfront acreage to coastal erosion, and to protect valuable coastal resources along the Montego Bay Waterfront and the marine ecosystems in the area. In addressing these and other realities to achieve disaster risk reduction, the government has worked to ensure that the development and environmental protection policies that individual ministries are expected to implement coverage in order to have maximum impact. In this way, we are avoiding unintended policy conflict and are actively driving increased partnership between ministries to achieve policy objectives. At the level of central government, active partnership between ministries is constantly pursued in order to achieve shared objectives. The Ministry of Environment and Housing, which is responsible for national water supply, partners with the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development, which is responsible for minor water supply. The ministry, which is also responsible for disaster mitigation and response, partners with the Ministry of Health and Wellness to manage the public health emergency, that is COVID-19. 
The partnership between central and local government is even more important when we examine the most effective ways of achieving an integrated and sustainable approach to disaster risk reduction. In the case of Jamaica, the legislative framework that provides a standard that promotes disaster risk reduction is significantly vested in the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development. It is responsible for Disaster Risk Management Act, which sets out the authority and the structures to deal with all types of disasters. The Act gives authority to the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management as Jamaica's National Disaster Agency. It also gives authority to the National Disaster Risk Management Council, which is chaired by the Prime Minister. Its constitution brings together over 30 categories of public and private sector partners, from the political opposition, mayors of municipality, to planning, public works, and public utility companies, and a wide range of voluntary organizations representing various interests, including the physically challenged. The regulation of the build environment is also critical to achieving disaster risk reduction, and local government is also responsible for implementing the Building Act. This law authorizes the National Building Code and set standard for certifying workers in the construction industry, a sector which continue to grow, even though the challenges of the pandemic at a rate of 6%. <clears throat> it empowers the local authority to act as local building authorities, responsible for the regulation of the build environment in their jurisdiction and for spatial order. It also facilitates the development approval process, which is managed by local authorities and is a structured multi-agency regulatory mechanism for ensuring that applications for construction projects of all types and sizes comply with all established rules. This is a critical process which receives application for construction projects for hotels, malls, houses, and everything in between, and their potential impact on our environment, as well as their ability to withstand disasters, are essential part of the consideration. Despite very significant advances, challenges remain. The placement of significant parts of Jamaica's housing stock, especially in formal settlements in environmentally sensitive area, is a major barrier to ideal levels of disaster risk reduction. While the Building Act has a specific objective of preventing squatting, a total government approach which features the Ministry of Housing and Urban Renewal, Environment and Climate Change is being implemented to address the, this problem through the development of a squatter management policy. The preliminary works involve a comprehensive survey of the extent of illegal settlements across Jamaica and 219 such areas across half of the country have already been assessed. The policy will not only address the prevention of squatting, but also the problem of what to do with the settlements that now exist. This issue is a multidimensional challenge to disaster risk reduction and our experience in managing COVID-19 has demonstrated this. I was privileged to assist 
in addressing these problems as mayor of Montego Bay before September 2020 and as a parliamentarian since. The movement of the pandemic from its initial arrival in the country in March last year and to the point when community spread was declared on September the 4th, 2020, is linked in no small way to the unplanned, intimate living connect condition unconnected to formal sanitation services that characterize the over 700 informal settlements that we have in Jamaica. The authority given by Disaster Risk Management Act effectively ensures that local government has and continue to play a vital role in managing all forms of disaster, including COVID-19. The implementation of all the public health protocols, inclusive of restrictions and other containment measures to fight the pandemic as its legal foundation in the Act. However, the challenge of increasing citizen responsibility to mitigate against disaster is one that confronts not only small island developing states, but countries with significant urban population. We need to consider the role and the total impact of the failure of personal responsibility in maintaining and increasing community and national vulnerabilities and the educational strategies and tactics to address this in the short to long term. It is a reality that nations are not ultimate unit of cooperation. Overcoming the challenge and achieving citizen involvement in disaster risk reduction to ensure the, mass, the maximum effectiveness of the effort of government will ensure that the scale of disaster mitigation and of building back better will be far less daunting than they are at present. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Minister Davis, um, for, for your address. I think it was quite insightful, uh, particularly with respect to the, the joined up approach and the significant and important role of local government. I was struck by the the example of the building act that you indicated and um, not to mention the, the role of the citizenry in, in, in our own responsibility for managing our own risk as well. Uh, colleagues, I, I believe now we have the pleasure of uh, seeing um, a, a short video on some recent regional experiences before we go to the round table uh, chaired by Mr. Robert Hill. So if we can cue the, the video, uh, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Good day, my name is Mikhail Johns, and I am representing the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development for Jamaica, MLGRD. Hurricanes, earthquakes, flooding, fires, drought, and most recently COVID-19 have caused devastation within the Americas and the Caribbean region. Disasters have claimed thousands of lives and have caused major disruption in our development, especially our economy. The effects of a disaster in terms of deaths, losses, and damages are large, but we need to remember disasters are not natural. They are the result of human actions and decisions. The effect of disasters depends on three variables, hazards, exposure, and vulnerability. Combined, they constitute risk, which in our context is increasingly related to climate change. As the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, reports point out, 
the impacts of climate change translate into disaster risk. And if society as a whole does not act now, the frequency and severity of disasters will increase. The region not only suffers from place-specific natural hazards, for example, Jamaica and hurricanes, we are now experiencing the effects of hazards that are transboundary in nature. Haiti and earthquakes, 2010 and 2021, saw neighboring countries have to grapple with being the receiving areas of displaced persons. The St. Vincent and the Grenadines have volcanoes where ash deposit in Barbados has reduced visibility and threatened communities' health and livelihood. Guyana has floods and dust moving from Africa has darkened the skies of Caribbean countries, increasing the risk of persons with respiratory problems. These realities have shown us that risks in one system have cascading effects that are manifested in other systems. As we have seen in the COVID-19 pandemic, the complex nature of risk requires us to look at the interrelationship between the urbanized world and other natural social systems. Traditionally, efforts were placed on specific climatic and geophysical hazards that countries in the region are prone to, and often disaster risk responders, DRR, were used to responding to one hazard at a time. Today, we are in a multi-hazard environment where first responders face multiple hazards that are complex or emerging hazards such as COVID-19, which are having an impact on the socioeconomic development of the countries across the Americas and the Caribbean. The challenges of managing the pandemic and the impacts of climate change have made two issues evident. The need for policy coherence amongst DRR, environmental management, climate change adaptation, and development policies, as well as the key role of the local government in supporting cohesion and sustaining DRR, climate change adaptation, CCA, and environmental interventions. And also moving forward to reverse the negative dynamic that we have generated with nature the region must rethink and innovate their national and local policies. The region is compelled to re-examine the way it deals with systemic risk, national strategies in the quest of achieving strategic coherent planning and implementation at the national and local level. Learn from the challenges national and local levels face in responding to climate-related hazards while responding to COVID-19 and creating a seamless, successful integration of DRR actions into local government and environmental systems. Promote local and community response as a necessary step to unearth the underlying risk factors and response capabilities existing at the local level, while capitalizing on the benefits of ecosystem-based approaches, which contribute to building resilience to disaster risk and climate change. The region is cognizant that achieving coherence requires an interconnected approach supported by multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary efforts which are aligned to the Sendai framework, Paris Agreement, Sustainable Development Goal, as well as each national adaptation plan. Also, that it is essential to advance the role of the local government and supporting sectors in providing incentives, nature-based and ecotourism solutions, as well as opportunities that support an integrated and sustainable approach to achieving DRR in the context of development decision-making and investments and environmental management. Disasters cause annual 314 billion US dollars in losses in the built environment alone, and climate change is expected to drive these losses even higher in the coming decades. Therefore, it is vital to enhance the role of local government, environmental management, and environmental sustainability as avenues to strengthen DRR in building resilient economies. And also to move towards securing investments in disaster risk reduction and resilience building to safeguard sustainable development and economic continuity of urban communities. 
taking measures to reduce and prevent the effect of disasters is something all territories have to consider, regardless of size, population, or location. Through the shelter management program, Jamaica moves towards preparedness. With a total of 867 shelters across the island, Jamaica is committed to temporarily house persons who may be impacted in a disaster event or live in vulnerable locations and have to move to a shelter before the impact of a hazard. Traditionally, the shelter management program has included training of shelter teams, shelter inspection and signage, and shelter mapping. Given the impact of COVID-19, shelter guidelines had to be revised in keeping with the COVID-19 standards to include sanitization, temperature checks, and isolation spaces designated for families within the shelter. An innovation coming out of guidelines is a new role. A designated member of the shelter team is now responsible for screening and temperature checks of shelterees prior to entering the facility. All facilities also have isolation rooms as stipulated by the Ministry of Health and Wellness, MOHW. These innovations done jointly by the Ministry of Health and Wellness and the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management ODPEM show the need for continuous review and adaptation of strategies to better respond to challenges posed by multi-hazard situations and the systemic nature of risk. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I will expect that um, Yuri would have thrown back to me, but thank you, Yuri. My name is Robert Hill, Chief Executive Officer of the Kingston and St. Andrew Municipal Corporation here in Kingston, Jamaica. So let me therefore say good morning, buenos dias, buenos tardes, bonjour, bon dia, from across the region, Kingston, to our partners and officials across the Latin America and Caribbean region joining us here for this roundtable session. You would have seen that the video preceding my presence here showed the operational framework of how we manage disasters in Jamaica. And it's my pleasure to introduce the members of this roundtable, first with my own boss, mayor and friend, Mayor Delroy Williams, CD Kingston and St. Andrew Municipal Corporation, the chairman of the Kingston and St. Andrew Municipal Corporation and Mayor of Kingston. Our good friend from Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Glenn Ram, Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago, the advisor to the Member of Parliament of Kumuto and Manzan Manzanilla in Trinidad. Our local representative in terms of disaster coordination, Ms. Eleanor Coombs with Parish Disaster Coordinator for the Parish of Clarendon, and of course, Mayor Maria Emilson Angulo, Mayor of Tumaco, Norino in Colombia. And these, ladies and gentlemen, are our members of the roundtable session, which will be addressing two major questions. The first question, how can greater coherence between policies, legislation, and planning for DRR, environmental management, and climate change adaptation, and development be fostered at both the national and local levels. The second question, what can local governments learn from COVID-19 for future pandemics and other disasters? I now invite His Worship the Mayor of Kingston, Senator and Councillor Delroy Williams to answer both these questions. Mayor Williams. Good. Good morning. Um, just provide some answers that will cover both questions. Uh, the time is limited, so let me try and just put forward some pointed um, information. First, I'd like to say that in terms of um, coherence in policy, the, the main approach would be you have to have a, a policy formulation process that is rigorous. Your policy formulation process must understand that environmental management, disaster risk reduction, climate change, risk management, emergency management, all of these are, they, they all transcend 
disciplines and transcend organizational borders, boundaries, which means that you require coordination in order to, in developing your, your policy. And, and that's what we mean by rig, being rigorous, it, that your policy formulation process must be inclusive, highly inclusive, which means that you're taking into consideration all the, the, the contributions from the various agencies and ministries and disciplines. It, the, the, the policy formulation process, by also being rigorous, we want it to, to what we refer to as seem, to have seamless coordination. And that is necessary because of the complexity of the issues confronting us, all the various issues which are climate change issues. So you, that, that complexity requires what, what we generally refer to as seamless coordination. And I've already come out in many of the speeches before. The, the also, because climate change issues are of longer time scales, and I separate climate change issues from climate related issues. So climate change issues are separate from climate related issues. Because climate change issues are of longer time scales, then your policy must be long term. And, and that long term policy direction is, is good for legislation. So because your policy is long term, or your set of policies, then it gives you the, t the time and the confidence to, to put in the set of legislation or legislative changes that will support the policy. And so for, for the, the point here is for your policies, your policies must be, formulation process must be rigorous, and the policies must be long-term in terms of their direction. I quickly also like to mention that local government to have the tools for effective and timely management, for, for us to have the tools for effective and timely management of risk, there are three specializations that must be brought together. One is the specialization of climate change. Then you have the specialization of risk management. Good morning to all. To all my friends from all over the Caribbean, Latin America, and the Americas, good morning to all. Um, I had the privilege of, of, of um, listening to my good friend and colleague from Jamaica, Maya Delroy, as it relates to the policy, legislation, and planning for DDR, envir environmental management, climate change adoption. Um, in terms of it, I agree that we need some rigorous, rigorous policies and um, legislation in terms of how we move forward in terms of these very important aspects. Um, in terms of the Trinidad and Tobago perspective, um, in 2019, we adopted the, uh, a passed in the Parliament uh, National Climate Change Policy, and it dealt with a number of um, framework and mitigation processes um, in terms of it. Um, so we were able to pass some laws and things that we wanted to transcend at the local level, some of it was adopted. But at the end of the day, with the whole impact of COVID-19 and so forth, um, we have the, the, the situation where we have to deal with additional disaster reduction risk. And in terms of it, um, local government, I'm saying in terms of Trinidad, local government is not given all the tools, resources, um, the adequate human resources, and so forth, even financial resources to actually deal with this. Um, things are done at a national level, um, but actually when it transcends down to local government, it's, 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 it's something that we have to deal with. So ten, I, I agree with in terms of policies and that needs to be taken at the national level so we could actually deal with um, policies and legislation. Because as was shown in the slide before, some of the disasters we have within our region. And um, 
Trinidad, we are, uh, we are not immune. We are um, known for flooding. Uh, we had a number of um, freak storms and storms that affected our country and it um, um, impacted the poor and the destitute and those at the lower end of the, of the ladder. So in terms of it, we need to really foster that, that um, policy and legislation, proper planning at the central government level and implement it in terms of the local government level so that we can actually deal with these disasters and so forth that happen. Um, also in terms of it is that we are very much strapped in terms of not only policies and legislation and planning has to be transcended more to the local government level so that we can actually, because local government is the body that deals with the grassroots person, the man on the street, the person at the lower echelon, as I said. So in terms of it, we really have to work on these. Yes, we might have um, policies and legislation that have been passed, but has it been transcended to local government? And again, with the eminence of, the, of COVID into the whole thing, um, our, 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 our resources have been stretched to capacity in terms of dealing with disasters within the region and so forth. So we, I, I am in support that we really need to, to foster these policies and get proper legislation and really have that twinning, so to speak, of the national level, at the national level, transcending to the local government level so that we could really deal with disaster and the disaster risk reduction within the region as I said, because we are not immune in Trinidad, we have dealt with a number of, of issues that affected this country and so people um, lost their lives and they lost their livelihood and so forth. And um, the thing about it too is that, um, just to detail a little bit, is that um, in terms of it, we are looking in this country that um, in terms of the agricultural sector, this is one of the sectors, and because of this whole issue with climate change and disasters and so forth, um, this has affected us a lot in our country. So we really need to foster and get that policy and get legislation in place and get that coordination so that we can really foster and deal with the issues that affect um, countries like ours and the region as a whole. Ram uh, from Trinidad and Tobago, please let's give him a round of applause. And as we move on with this roundtable discussion, it's my pleasure to introduce a local practitioner here in Jamaica. She is Mrs. Eleanor Coombs with the Parish Disaster Coordinator for the Municipal Corporation of Clarendon. Mrs. Wyth, over to you. Thank you, sir, and a pleasant good morning to everyone. In attempting to answer these two questions posed, I want to, I want to, present to you two areas of suggestion to improve greater coherence in uh, the disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. They are improved coordination and strengthened financial resources and mainstreaming climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction principles in our daily operations. Institution, institutional entities with the responsibility to coordinate often do not have or are limited to implement and fund various projects and programs outlined by policies, especially at the local implementation level. It is critical that the human, technical, institutional and financial capacities are strengthened so that these policies, standards and regulations are effectively coordinated and enforced and this will result in better enforcement of no-build zones, the preservation and management of protected areas, such as our mangroves, our forests, and our rivers, and managing and reducing risk, such as facilitated informed decisions to reduce development in vulnerable areas. Another area that I would like to focus on is improving the engagement of civil society and institutions on various platforms and through partnership with the NGOs, donor agencies, and the ministry's department agencies. This improvement or this engagement will improve policy and legislative currents in environmental management process. By utilizing the various mechanisms and mediums, 
Parishes such as Clarendon, Manchester, St. Catherine have led the development of a local sustainable development plan, which lays the foundation of the formulation and implementation of environmental actions, which includes disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation projects and uh, programs. It is important that the promotion of these environmental management, including DRR and CAA, is critical to the success of the Sendai framework, which is also aligned to the Vision 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. The message of re resilience requires a deliberate, robust communication strategy among all sectors and civil society, which is indicative to address the issues of making climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction a way of life, a lifestyle, and not just another policy document. Local authorities, in partnership with ministries such as Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development, and entities such as Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management and National Environment Planning Agency and other donor agencies have credited much success in establishing mitigation and public education campaigns to, to better respond to the effects of climate change and disaster risk reduction. Risk-informed evidence-based plans with proper monitoring evaluation system targets the improvement and designation, the improvement of designated shelters especially in flood-prone and low-lying areas, the strategic placement and equipping of emergency stores, the constant training and retraining of emergency volunteers, and the installation of signs and early warning systems. These are simple but profound processes that are engaged in building capacity. These processes, however, can only be sustainable by our financial incentives, the use of traditional and social media and investing, heavily investing in human and technical capacity. It is necessary for all entities to strengthen the strategic operational and technical capacity for greater resilience. And prioritizing disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation to sector and civil society's visions and goals will enable the success of goals number four in Vision 2030 and goal number 13 of the Sustainable Development Goals Action to align in with the Sendai framework and other climate actions. So facilitating incentives, strengthening capacity and increasing resources to prepare, respond and recover in urban centers as well as rural town centers with urban characteristics highlights the importance of investing more in established risk-informed evidence-based plans with proper monitoring and evaluation system, which, which will result in well-guided, detailed decision, policy making, planning, and continuous learning that will improve synergy at all levels, reduce local risk and vulnerability, and of course, increase resilience. Now, COVID-19 has is a radical, has come with radical uncertainties and caused trauma worldwide. And municipalities are therefore mandated to manage other emergency, emerging hazards while maintaining or managing this pandemic. It is therefore critical that proper assessment and planning, utilization of resources, sensitizations and simulations be effectively implement, implemented to adapt or actually respond to an event. I want to present to you that to attain maximum resilience, we need to partner for resilience. And how do we do this? To increase this resilience for future pandemics and other emerging hazards, we need to invest in and develop multi-hazard risk assessment profile with communities and local authorities that are densely populated and with eco-social vulnerabilities to forecast various models. And this will show the probability of the spread and best, best responses with locality. We also need to strengthen partnership and establish networks to train, assist, and support persons in the parish, especially to the vulnerable population, to include psychosocial support system, and establish and maintain multi-level coordination 
a bipartisan committee, and that was practiced in Clarendon, to include relevant key stakeholders to establish proper decision making for real time issues, policy for necessary intervention, and crisis management. And last but not least, exercise priority planning by aligning the short term emergency responses with the long term effects of the pandemic to include food, medical, educational, and economic security. In essence, the pandemic has provided opportunities for municipalities to think out of the box in addressing and responding to other hazards and crisis management. It is therefore essential for local governments to practically engage all key, stake key stakeholders sorry, through consultations for better and efficient multi-coordination and cooperation to achieve resilience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Wirth. Very comprehensive response. Let me invite now Mayor Maria Emilsen Angulo, Mayor of Tumaco, Nariño, in Colombia. Hola, muy buenos días para todos. Quiero agradecer esta importante invitación para participar de este espacio. Con respecto a la primera pregunta, eh, frente a qué se podría hacer para fomentar una mayor coherencia entre los aspectos que eh, se tocaron. Eh, como alcaldesa de, de un municipio eh, relativamente pequeño, Considero que los mandatarios nos enfrentamos eh, a muchísimas problemáticas que tiene una comunidad y que son eh, diarias, permanentes, que la ciudadanía espera resultados inmediatos de nuestra parte, pero eh, claramente no existe una eh, tranquilidad también para la ciudadanía en el sentido de que el mandatario tenga una conciencia ambiental y aparte de los problemas que nos enfrentamos con muchas deficiencias económicas eh, diariamente, hay otros problemas que existen, que son reales y que a veces no eh, los conocemos, como son las emergencias que simplemente llegan en un momento determinado y nos toca enfrentar. Así las cosas eh, yo considero que existe una gran necesidad por parte de los gobiernos a nivel nacional de Colombia, mi país y de otros países, que empecemos a, a entender el, el ejercicio de planificación no como un ejercicio de cada cuatro años, como es en mi país, por ejemplo, que se generan nuevas elecciones y llegan nuevos mandatarios, sino que yo creo que de una vez por todas, atendiendo el, la problemática ambiental, pero también muchas otras problemáticas que se viven en los, en los países, y es que empecemos a entender la importancia de la planeación prospectiva. Definitivamente, si nosotros planificamos el territorio, no a tres años, a cuatro años, sino por lo mínimo a 20 años, esto nos induce de alguna manera a hacer un ejercicio consciente y responsable. ¿A qué me refiero? Por ejemplo, eh, considero que en el momento en que se tome la decisión de hacer ese ejercicio de planeación prospectiva, debe ser un ejercicio que involucre a la ciudadanía a pensar en sus riesgos que tienen con respecto al tema de desastres, que los identifique con claridad pero que proyecte, proyecte la gestión y la ejecución de acciones de mitigación en el corto, mediano y largo plazo. Cuando existan esos planes que sean obligatorios a 20 años, los gobiernos que lleguen, que pueden ser responsables o irresponsables con los temas ambientales, no tendrán la opción de decidir si quieren o no quieren atender la gestión de riesgo sino que tendrán de manera obligatoria, porque ya hay una carta de navegación, ya hay un documento que construyó la ciudadanía. Pero además de esto, ese alcalde llegará a cumplir con una misión que ya está escrita y ya está establecida, pero que también, a mi manera de ver, tienen que generarse cambios legislativos que permitan que la ciudadanía 
y también los legislativos hagan control a esos candidatos, a esos alcaldes o, o gobernantes y que se haga una evaluación anual de sus planes de gobierno y se determine, dependiendo de la evaluación, si pueden continuar o no dentro de su ejercicio administrativo. Y eso va a depender en la medida en que hayan atendido, hayan administrado esa gestión de riesgo. Por lo tanto, sigo convencida de que la herramienta más importante, aparte de todas las que se han señalado que me parecen supremamente importantes para lograr la coherencia, porque las leyes la mayoría ya están establecidas, todos sabemos lo que debemos hacer. Aquí lo que se requiere es voluntad política del gobernante de tun turno que entienda la importancia de gestión de riesgo, pero también de una ciudadanía que se empodere y que también haga control y seguimiento y que entienda. Porque a veces nos dedicamos a atender las problemáticas del día a día, arreglar las calles, hacer los parques, pero cuando nos llegan las emergencias y los desastres estamos totalmente eh, fuera de base y no estamos preparados para estas situaciones y no las atendemos sino cuando llegan, pero no generamos la gestión como tal, como debe ser a mi manera de ver. Eh, frente a la segunda pregunta, con respecto pues, a los aprendizajes y las enseñanzas que nos, de, nos deja el COVID y por supuesto también otros desastres que pudieran generar después de habernos enfrentado como mandatarios a, a esta situación tan compleja y difícil, yo quedo con varias enseñanzas. Primero, el manejo de las emociones. Eh, existe la necesidad de, de con cautela eh, y, y tranquilidad, a veces eh, en medio de la turbulencia, salir de ella y, y seguro así podemos tomar buenas decisiones para enfrentarlas todas estas situaciones que se presentan. Lo segundo y la enseñanza quizás más importante es el trabajo interinstitucional. Solos nunca podemos tenemos que sentar a todas las entidades, a todas las instituciones, a todos los gobiernos y a la misma comunidad a planificar. Segundo, el tema de planeación, que siempre juega un papel fundamental en este ejercicio y para el tema de las emergencias, la planeación y el control debe ser diario. Nosotros organizábamos unos PMU y diariamente generábamos acciones, controles y seguimiento a lo que veníamos realizando y Creo que un aspecto importante, definir en el medio de las emergencias decisiones y soluciones estructurales. Muchos mandatarios nos quedamos entregando mercados, resolviendo problemas del día a día, pero invertimos muchos recursos en, esa, en ese tipo de situaciones por eh, atender el populismo y, 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 la, y la ciudadanía, pero tenemos que hacer un par y pensar en que aunque algunas decisiones no sean tan populares, son las fundamentales como fortalecer nuestras entidades de salud, como atender problemas estructurales hacia futuro. Y vuelvo e insisto en que quizás la experiencia más importante es generar un diagnóstico dentro de cada territorio para identificar los riesgos que vamos a tener en el futuro en salud, en fenómenos naturales y otras eh, existentes en cada territorio que cada uno tiene sus particularidades diferentes y empezar a trabajar para que nos puedan encontrar futuras pandemias y futuros desastres mucho más preparados eh, y pues por supuesto evitar pérdidas de vida y poder eh, defender la ciudadanía, la integridad y la salud de nuestras comunidades muchísimas gracias A round of applause for Mayor Maria Emilcen Angulo, Mayor of Tumaco Nariño in Colombia. Thank you very much, Mayor. And it has been our pleasure to be the host of this roundtable discussion. We certainly derived very rich information and instruction from the discussions and responses that were had from our panelists. Uh, a quick rundown of development of primary legislation, the greater focus on climate change and issues at the national and local government level, and how those affect each other, the specifications in climate change, specializations in climate change, risk management, and disaster management, and through involved training and exposure of specific funding, funding is very important, to transcend meaningfully to the local government system. We must critically assess the effects of climate change on agriculture and manufacturing in small island developments, developing states especially, 
uh, the enforcement of no-build zones, protection of, of sensitive environmental areas, and robust communication strategies through public education. We should partner for resilience in COVID-19 and offer necessary psychosocial support. Results must be measurable and learnable. The exercise of the emergency, the active involvement of our citizens, and the emphasis on performance outcomes. It has been my pleasure to be your moderator, and let me again thank Mayor Delroy Williams, Mayor of Kingston, Mr. Glenn Ram of the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago, Ms. Eleanor Coombs, Parish Disaster Coordinator for Clarendon Municipal Corporation, and Mayor Maria Emilsen Angulo, Mayor of Tumaco, Narino, Colombia. I throw back to Yuri, our general host, for this parallel session six. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert, and thank you to the panelists. Um, uh, excellent, very rich um, conversation. Um, I, I think the, the, the thing that is striking me the most is that I think that there is consensus that obviously um, greater policy coherence is needed. I was struck by uh, the mayor of Kingston's um, outlook, particularly uh, that you know we should be having a long-term policy direction. Um, in summary, uh, some of the some of the things that that really jumped out, I think, was the 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 need for coordination, greater stakeholder collaboration between private sector, civil society, and government in the planning. Um, noticeably, the resource constraint uh, that was identified um, by 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 the mayor from Trinidad. Um, but what was quite interesting for me was um, the, the point that was introduced by the mayor from Colombia um, with respect to um, almost uh, performance-based um, measurement or monitoring of risk management performance at the local government level, and that the citizenry having a role in, in um, observing that risk management performance by the authorities. So I think generally the consensus is that um, greater policy coherence is needed, more seamless coherence is needed, um, obviously more legislative work, but uh, a lot of effort on the coordination uh, and the resourcing um, of, of that, that, that coordination. Um, before we close out, um, perhaps we can go to the questions um, that were identified on the, on the screen, I think um, the key question with respect to major gaps to integrating local government, local governance and local planning for sustainable environmental management and disaster risk reduction, uh, I think um, an overwhelming majority of people identified um, finance and management are, are the major gaps. So I think we have a clear readout that's consistent with what was presented by the panelists um, in terms of the uh, uh, gaps and, and challenges and uh, large consensus around uh, financing and, and management. Can we have the second question? In terms of practices and having the, the that are having the most impact on local governance and environmental management, supporting DRR in the region. Uh, overwhelming response was that partnerships for disaster risk reduction and climate adaptation at local level is required. So I think um, that too, um, the overwhelming response by participants uh, uh, actually um, fit quite nicely with what um, the experiences of our local government officials and mayors um, have advocated in, in, the, in the round table conversation. Okay, well, um, I think it's, it's my, my, uh, my pleasure to, to be able to say thanks to everyone for their participation and their contribution. I think we've had a very rich, um, very rich discussion. And um, I, I wish to thank all of the, the, the contributors to this discussion. I know it was compact um, and a lot of ground to cover in a short space of time. 
But um, if I had to choose two words uh, to sort of describe, um, you know, what what the consensus would be in, in terms of actions or, or priorities that we should be pursuing to address um, this challenge of policy coherence and resourcing at, at the local level, I would say it is adaptive management. So um, that we 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 have to be cognizant that while we need policies um we also need the financial resources we need the coordination we need the leadership um to to give effect to this and um in the back of our minds we should all be thinking about adaptive management based on the 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 scenarios and the almost sort of cascading scenarios confronting us with that um I'll close. So thank you very much um, for for your your participation and your attention. loud and clear adapt or die thank you so very much to moderator yuri chakalal senior specialist natural disaster and risk management inter-american development bank uh, he was in charge of the parallel session six and i'd also like to acknowledge robert hall who was the round table moderator i'd also like to acknowledge the moderator lisa mariana hernandez Met Metancourt, regional lead for americas and the caribbean global network of civil society organizations for disaster reduction gndr she was the moderator for parallel session five we just would like to remind you to use the hashtag rp21 we do have a live twitter feed right now on hopping so we want to keep you active and engaged and we want to know what are the things that are resonating with you the most we will see you back at 11 where we will continue with our learning lab and parallel session seven see you then Thank you.